Uh, hello, all you hardcores out there, how are you doing? It's uh, Russ here from Porky's Corner, the voice of hardcore boxing. Uh, before I introduce my uh, next guest and uh, one of the most popular ones on my channel, I just want to give a big shout out to Eastwood Autos next door in, in Nobram. Uh, they've got a factory the same size as us. Massive car park over there, one at the back. We've got a sale on with 85 cars and they've sold about 22 in two days. And I think they've done about four today already. So uh, BMW's out isn't lot. All the lots got a book as to a lot of space here. There's X5s a lot. They're giving them away, you know, like something like five grand up to eight grand cars and that all trade and stuff and that. And uh, so I just want to say a big thank you to uh, Eastwood Auto. So back in Porky's Corner. And like I said, if you're after the car, Get you sent down here. So, uh, so now I'm joined by Julian. How are you doing, Julian? We'll just get uh, his bugs off. Are you all right, mate? All good. All good, Russell. How are you? I'm all right. I've uh, first first time I've done a bit of training in, in, in a week. I've uh, I went to a birthday party last week and I've been bad all uh, I've been bad all week. Uh, I'm not a big boozer, right? And uh, so first time first time I've done out today. So are you are you all right? What's weather yeah. like over your way? It's just raining now, mate. I've just been working all day and it's just started going. It's gone really uh, dark, and I'm thinking we've got some some heavy rain coming, mate. Yeah. Well, we'll go we'll go straight in then. Uh, first of all, if anybody's uh, interested in coming on channel, uh, you know, you're a big boxing fan or anything, don't be shy. It's porkycorn at mail.com. Right, Julian. Uh, we might as well go straight in there. Mm -hmm. Taylor against Catrell. Uh, Ian John Lewis has been, I'm not going to say found guilty, he's been demoted from an A star to a B star apparently, and he can't do championship fights or something. And uh, uh, the Catrell and Taylor, sorry, Catrell's been made, been recommended to be mandatory for all belts across the division. Do you feel that that's a... Uh, Come, it's sort of like works out well for the board how it's worked out. Yeah, it's one of those, isn't it? You've got to be seen to, to be doing something. I mean, we know historically they haven't done that much when it comes to poor officiating. And I think the the public outcry for this and obviously where this has led to, you know, potentially a police investigation, etc., yeah. has meant that they've got to be seen to, doing, to do something. So what the board have done is they've done the absolute bare minimum that they can do. Um, if, if you think about it, we all know it was an horrendous scorecard. It was absolutely shocking. But there's so many contradictions. And I saw Jamie Moore talking earlier on, and, and he was absolutely right. He says, there's so many contradictions with what they're saying. So first of all, Robert Smith, he said on Talk Sport that it was a really, really close fight. It was scrappy and the rounds were hard to score. So if that was the case, and the, and the fight was scrappy and the rounds were hard to score, then Ian, Ian John Lewis, under that lens, wouldn't have really put together a bad scorecard because whenever you get a close fight and all the rounds are scrappy and each round is competitive, you can have a competitive fight and have a five or six point spread. And that's what some people don't understand about boxing. If, fight, if every single round is hard to score, you can get a big spread. So it's conceivable under the lens that Robert Smith has said that Ian John Lewis's scorecard isn't a bad scorecard, but we know it's an horrendous scorecard. So you're basically saying it's a close fight, it was scrappy, it was hard to score, and you know, but I have an issue with the width of his scorecard, and it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You just got to turn around and say, look, it was an horrendous scorecard. Two of the three judges got the wrong fighter winning. The one judge who had it for Taylor also got it wrong because he had it way too close. And there were so many rounds in that fight that were very, very easy to score. So we need to have an investigation into that. So I found it really lame, the notice that the board put out. Um, and in some ways, and there's not many people will say this, and you know, I, we, we just sort of talk on the fly on this show. It might sound lame but it's quite hard on Ian John Lewis because I think you've made him a scape scapegoat for what was three really bad scorecards 
all three of them, absolutely horrendous. And he's the one you've put out there under the lens, under the magnifying glass to basically make it look like you're doing something. So you, you on one hand, you're saying, we're going to demote you. And on the other hand, you're saying, but we don't have a big argument, the fact that you got Josh Taylor winning. And it's just weak. It's quite pathetic, actually. And it's not good enough, and it doesn't change the result, does it? What about the other two judges? Because uh, Foster had it six each, and uh, Laughlin had it seven five, didn't he? Yeah, they all got completely the wrong score, didn't they? And that's what I said when I spoke about this a couple of weeks ago, was uh, just after it happened. I thought seven, seven, probably eight rounds were really easy to score. Right. Catterall was just outlanding him. His work was cleaner. His defensive work was cleaner. Everything was better. And the rounds that Catterall won, I thought were quite dominant rounds. And then the rounds that Taylor won were kind of scrappy and you could see how he won them on, on work rate, for example, potentially the second round, 12th round. But I just thought, I keep thinking the same thing. It was just a horrendous scorecard. There's no, there's no going, going about it in any other way. And had that been any other fight, you know, we've seen these decisions over the years just for a random belt, they wouldn't have done anything. It's simply because the, the public outcry and the fact that this was for all the belts, why the board had been seen to do something. So how can you say, Russell, it's the same point, but how can you say, we don't have an issue with the fighter he, he had winning, so we don't have an issue with the fact that he thought Josh Taylor won. But what we're also going to do is going to, you know, pledge with all the boxing organisations that Catterall gets a shot at the titles. Why? If you think you got, if you think you got the right fighter, why, why is the Border Control backing Jack Catterall um, to get, you know, to get a rematch or to fight for the vacant belts? So they're clearly conflicted in what they're actually saying. I think there was a focus. It's like when you put out communications at business and Terry and Rico, those guys will do this all the time. Those are smart guys. When you put out communications from a business that goes to the public, you have to really look at the wording of that and you have to have it vetted and vetted and vetted and make sure it's crystal clear what you're saying and yeah. there are no contradictions in that communications. The communications they put out is just nonsense. It's just rubbish. It's like, we're all right with the guy, you know, the, we've demoted him. We're pledging for Catrell to get a rematch or to fight for vacant belts. We'll make sure of that. So you're saying on one hand, there's an injustice. And on the other hand, you're saying, well, there was nothing untoward and we don't have an issue with who we had, who we had winning, just the margin. Nonsense. Do you feel that they're alone to themselves now? They just feel like they're dealing with it internally, even though all the eyes of the sports world are on them, not just the boxing world, the old sports media are watching them, aren't they? Absolutely. And, and that's, that's the frustration, isn't it? Because that could have been an epic night where an underdog, who very few of us saw winning that fight. You did, I didn't. An underdog get some glory. The win, the winner, unified belt, and it's just such a great night for sport when that happens because it shakes the sport and it shows that not all these fights are kind of like you know home favorite gets an easy night. It shows that upsets happen in sport. That's what sports about. It's about the drama. It's not about the controversy and it's not about the the corruption and it's not about the, the bullshit. It's about the drama. And about guys or, or women achieving their sort of life, lifelong, you know, lifelong dream, and they've just ruined it. They've completely ruined it. So there's only one thing, and I'm sure there's not a precedent, but there's only one thing that puts this right. First thing that puts this right is an absolute um, reverse the decision. You have you have to reverse. That won't happen. That never happens. So you reverse the decision. And then you demand an immediate rematch. And even though Josh Taylor's talking about moving up and then he says, I'll fight him again at catch weight. I think for, for Taylor, and I have to say that Josh Taylor as well, there's an element of not nowhere near the amount of sympathy I have for Catterall, but there's an element of sympathy for Josh Taylor because he's a real outstanding champion. He's got a, a big following in Scotland. There's a chance for him on Sky now to start to become a real big household name. And his first opportunity that he's had is now almost cast as a villain for something that he really hasn't done. He's yeah. just The only thing he hasn't done is he hasn't owned the loss. Neither him or his coach have owned the loss. And that's frustrating for me. 
Yeah, it leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Obviously, I've been very vocal on that, and uh, I've probably uh, screamed that much. I had to blow some steam off last week, and it took me a week to recover. But I just it just left a bad taste in my mouth, and I was starting to think, you know, what am I getting involved in? You know, it's just it's not first time, is it? It's all time, isn't it? And it'll probably happen again in a couple of months, and then what then? I mean, when are people, when are people going to say? Enough is enough here with, the, with this board of control. When when's that going to happen? And that that's the problem, is it? It's every single week now, and you know this is not even with the with the spotlight on the small hall shows because yeah. you know up and down the country okay. um, on the small hall shows there'll be absolute shit decisions given to the home fighters themselves. Tickets week in week out. We always talk about these journeymen. Yeah. who might have 50 losses on their record and at least 10 of those, 15 of those fights, they would have won that fight. And it, it happens and it's absolutely scandalous. And I can see you, you get disillusioned with the sport. I get disillusioned with the sport that I don't really want to be active in it anymore. And I just talk about it when I, when I have time to talk about it and I enjoy it, talking to like-minded people such as yourself. But it does leave a sour taste because it's every single time, without fail, and people, people are saying, well, both are MTK fighters. And, you know, it doesn't make any sense for that decision to, you know, well, let's not say the word for that decision to, it wasn't the right decision. But ultimately, the platform, the spotlight was on growing Josh Taylor, wasn't it? He's yeah. had a brilliant run. He was number one in the division. And he's a real fighter who's going to become more marketable. I think that was the one of the association with Sky. They're going to grow him and grow him and grow him. And... It just stinks, and it's it's every time now, isn't it? You know, it used to be a bit of a joke, but on the match room, you know, Eddie loves a draw. There was that, and then there was obviously some um, Ricky Burns. Uh, was it the Beltran fight? And Eddie Ricky loves Burns. a rematch. It used to be, didn't it? Ed, Ed, yeah, Eddie loves a rematch. It was a Ricky Burns decision, and it was time and time and time again. And this is the problem with boxing: is we see these what potentially are great matchups, and we should get a great fight or a great event. And we just get controversy and bullshit. And I'll never be convinced by anybody that that was a close fight. And if Robert Smith, again, back to the board of control, the head of the board of control says it was a close fight. I have no words because either your scoring criteria needs publishing and you need to explain the, the scoring criteria to everybody out there. Because the one thing that has been consistent with this fight is Every single, because I've, I heard some comments um, from Ben Davison sort of saying people having an opinion who don't have a right to an opinion. Well, what about all of the people, okay, who watch that fight, who are license holders, ex-boxers, managers, trainers, promoters, nobody in the sport of boxing thought that was a close fight. Never mind, thought Josh Taylor won. Nobody agrees with you. Nobody agrees with Robert Smith it was a close fight. And these are, these are people who are really, you know, if you want to be patronising and say not casuals, these are people who are really well-versed in the scoring of boxing. So you've either changed the criteria for scoring and you haven't told us and you've shared that with the judges or <laughs> something's really, really wrong. You think that, uh, well, P Peter Fury were uh, the most vocal person I've seen on social media, did an interview with uh, he was screaming in front of his sacks. He gave it uh, eight rounds to two with two shared to uh, Jack Cattrall. And he what made it very clear that he wants the lot sacking. Very clear. And he's a laminate holder. Uh, what do you think will happen there? Well, I think, first of all, good for Peter Fury. I mean, I'm a laminate holder, but I'm not an active laminate holder like Peter Fury. Peter Fury has to go to the shows and has to be around things. And, and he will know, will Peter, he will know that sometimes... Being outspoken can hurt you. Oh, but God. if you're not outspoken, certainly being a license holder, things will never change. And the one thing with Peter Fury is they'll never say it to his face, will they? If they have an issue with Peter Fury, they won't say it to his face. And I, I watch a lot of Peter Fury interviews online. I don't watch too much online, but I do what when he speaks, I listen. Mm -hmm. I can learn as a coach. Yeah. And you can just learn really how he presents himself and, and how he just how he is. He's a very, very clever man. And that's not you know, brown nose, and I'm just saying, if, if I don't think someone's great, I will say it. And if I think someone's an absolute 
top coach and a, a good guy, then I'll say that as well. He always comes across as that. He doesn't really care what people think, but ultimately he, he will know he's he will know that he's just saying what everybody else is thinking and that's the problem but nobody else is worried but i guess with peter fury if you look at the, some of his fighters they've been inactive you know like savannah marshall and things you know, and huey they've been inactive and pushed out of situations so he probably thinks well do you know what i'm not exactly getting any favors as it is so i might as well just say it say it as it is and, and there's nothing better for me than an uncompromising man he didn't really say much, for Peter, in in in, uh, in camp. I've done two camps with him, and it, we. Uh, I remember once he left uh, Bobby Reed in charge. Uh, uh, you know, who were doing pads and whatnot. There were me, Bunny, Robin Reed, and Peter who come in. He came in one day about half seven at night, and uh, he come in and he, he he came in really slowly. He doesn't say a lot, and uh, it was like that. And everybody start, you know, putting a bit of effort in and. Uh, yeah, and he, he don't send out. He just give that look. <laughs> but he's he's taking everything in, isn't he? He's, 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 yeah, yeah. he's taking everything in, and he's not fooled by anything. Feel like Joe Gallagher. I'm watching Joe Gallagher and uh, in a uh, in his gym, and Joe. Will, I said, I'm watching you, Joe. Well, Joe, will walk, he was still in one position, but he was looking in a mirror, so he had his eye on uh, Natasha Jonas. Callum Johnson and the Alex Dele De Lagmani, I can't, I can't pronounce his name, we were, we were with Mick Money, honestly. All at the same time, he's seen that poor kid multitasking, and he, were, he had his eye on all of them. And even if you think they're not watching, a good, a good trainer's watching, aren't they, all the time, right? You know I, I mean? I've seen Joe do that. Obviously, I've taken fighters over there to yeah. spar Sykes, you know, to, to spar Joe's lads. And, and I've seen him, I think Sykes was once sparring Stephen Smith, like 10 years ago, whenever. And I thought it was a bit strange because Joe Webb chat, he always make you a couple, always friendly, have a little mm. chat about boxing. And then when the sparring starts, Joe goes to one corner and he literally, there's no more engagement with Joe. He's like totally professional. And Sykes was sparring Stephen Smith and Sykes was sparring well on that occasion and Smith wasn't really doing much. And I just saw Joe just go in the corner, let, he let Smith know he wasn't, you know, he wasn't really happy with what he was doing. And then he walked away and I thought, oh, Joe's not watching it. And he was just doing what you've just said. He was looking in the mirror yeah. and he was stood away. So I'd say, I'm not going to spoon feed you. I've told you what I need you to do. I'm not going to baby you. And now you need to, you need to do it. And they just left him for a couple of rounds. It was, it was kind of like, it was good to watch actually, because you learn from watching coaches and stuff and they've all got different natures. And then he went back and Smith kind of picked up the spar and it was a good spar. The spar about two or three times him and Gary. And he, you're right, he's always watching. And Peter Fury would be just the same, I imagine. Yeah. I don't know him personally. Yeah, but And he'd also be one of those guys that when he's in the gym, he's not there to make friends. He's not there for the social aspect. He's just coaching. You know, well, people Peter, thought I was a bit social. Yeah, a lot of Peter's of the opinion, like, uh, you know, if, if uh, you know, people that take, like, the mates at gym and that, and, Obviously, you know, when Tyson were there, you know, you got world heavyweight champion as Huey there. And, you know, it can be a bit overwhelming and people want to fetch the mates down and that. And Peter's like, well, would, would uh, because people want to go see people lay bricks on a building site in winter? They don't. It's a place of work, isn't it? Absolutely. Do you know what I mean? And he's of that opinion. And a bit like McCracken, he's like that, like, do you know what I mean? A bit old school. Yeah, you just know uh, to work. It's as, it's as simple as that. It's not a celebrity thing. And, you know, there are times what, what we used to do, because even though it was only, only Gary Sykes, but it, it was a big name in Dewsbury. So whenever he had a big fight, whether it was a Johansson, the Morris, all these sort of big, what to us were big fights, the British title fights were big fights. We used to do a public workout. So we'd do the, we'd lock the doors in the gym, we'd do our graft. And then maybe on the Monday or the Tuesday, we'd just open the gym and he, the work would be done then. And he'd just mess around, skipping it in the bag having a chat. There might have only been 70, 80 people there, but, you know, kids would come and that type of thing, you know, maybe use it as an excuse to sell a few tickets, shift a few T-shirts and just things to help him out. And then it's come because even though it was a small town, the press followed him massively. There was two, two rival papers in Dewsbury, but that's what it was there for. It's like, that's a night where you can come and you can watch and you can see what's going on. Yeah. But every other time the door shut, 
it's not uh, like you say, you, you wouldn't bring your kids to work, you wouldn't bring your friends to work. So what do you think we're doing here? I don't bring my two here. <laughs> They're not insured anyway to be in here, so, you know, so... Yeah, public but, liability and all that. Yeah, it's a nightmare. Uh, okay, then. Uh, so the, 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 it looks like Border acting on it, and it's, it's like a half-hearted uh, approach, isn't it? Do you feel that it's uh, in bad taste? How it's been dealt with, and then the boxing border control awards, you know, like more or less after, you know, a week after. And I, I do you think, it, uh, I, do you think they should have had them awards, or do you think you should have just said to them, "Don't turn up, you won the one." It's a bit of a it, hard yeah. one, isn't it? It's a difficult one because I don't know how the awards work. I've never been to them as even as a license holder. I've never seen the point of going down to London. Um, just to sit there and pay for a table and to just, you know, see the big cliques gathering together. But I don't know how it works in terms of if it's like seasonal. So is, it, is there a start and stop date? So is it, is, is it included? Is, is Josh Taylor's win over Caterell included in his body of work for the last 12 months? Or is it for the prior season, August to August? So that's non-applicable because you would look, wouldn't you? And you would say, well, I'm, I'm not really sure about fight of the year. Yes, you're number one and mm. you're undisputed, but is it to the Ramirez fight or is it afterwards? But to your point, um, it's a difficult one asking if it's in bad taste because if you're Josh Taylor and you're Ben Davison, you, you haven't technically done anything wrong, have you? They haven't made the decision, have they? They haven't, they haven't made the decision. Um, so it's a really, really difficult one, but... I'm just so frustrated that if you're Jack Catterall now and, you know, Ian John Lewis has been dropped, dropped down a level as an official, as a, as a judge, what, so what? If you're Jack Catterall, you're like, well, so what? I don't, want, I don't want the guy hung. I mean, you know, he hasn't killed anybody. I don't want the guy hung, but he's made a serious, and the others, by the way, they've made serious errors of judgment that's cost me my dream, so I'm not happy about it. And it's interesting, the knock-on effect that it's having now, because Tyson Fury's been very vocal, and Fury's saying, I, I don't want English judges in yeah. my fight. You know, I don't, I, I don't want them. Frank Warren's been quite vocal about that. So what, in effect, are they actually saying? Is Frank Warren, and I'm not doing his thinking for him, is, are Warren and Fury concerned about the judging, or are they concerned about the fact that these judges spend a lot of time on matchroom shows? Well, maybe you see, but I, I've I've uh, started to wonder that. But I've all I also like to look at it like they like a bit of drama, don't they? As well, don't they? You know, yeah. it all adds to. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Fury, Fury got jobbed by. American judges didn't he, against Wilder the first time. So first time, yeah, yeah. Well, so he said. I thought it were no, no. Me. Yeah, you come back a yeah. case for a draw, couldn't you? You come back a case I, for a Wilder win, could you? I when I watched it, um, I watched it on my phone actually at the time um, on the app in bed, and I scored it at, at the time as I watched it, and I had Fury winning by a point, and I don't think you know. Obviously, there were the two-point knockdown rounds, and people said Fury won easy. He absolutely didn't, because there were seven or eight rounds where the punch output was so low. Yeah. Wilder was landing six, and Fury was landing eight. Wilder's well, cleaner, more power. Or well, don't you go on to ring generalship when it's very close like that? Don't that that's out. apparently, yeah. Or well, who's going to also in the fight, or what the judge was looking for? It's, oh, what? Yeah, what they used to say in the in the kind of in the eight seventies, eighties, and nineties was there were four criteria for for scoring a, a, a fight. There was obviously punches landed was the first criteria, effective aggression was the second criteria, ring generalship was the third, and defense was the fourth. And I think the the kind of simplified it really because the the overrider is punches landed. And yeah, you're right. In the case of when it's a quite an even round in the UK with with the border control, they'll say they'll say defence stroke style, which effectively is the same as you know range generalship um, yeah. and defence. But it, it's that's that's what I'm saying. That's why they they need to be clarified now 
what it is, what's the overriding, because it's the it's the question all the time that people ask. If you're in a if you're in a fight and you land 10 solid jabs and your opponent lands three left hooks and three right hands, who wins the round? Uh, because well, a jab can be a clean scoring punch. Yeah. Effective scoring punch. What if it rocks his head back or if it just tickled him? Yeah, so, and this is where it becomes really, really difficult to score, doesn't it? Because you, you, you the, a solid jab, you know, like in, in the amateurs, for example, a solid jab is the equivalent to a, a, a power shot. And in the pros, what is the criteria? You know, a big right hand, does that override three jabs? And the ball, the, the scoring of a fight is, it's black and white in terms of, the rules, but it's very, very grey when someone tries to explain it, and that that's one of the challenges. And I think that's why what we need to have is we need to either have an investigation to scoring, or we need to have an explanation of scoring. Because if you have to be like you're judging a fight and it's the undisputed championship of the world, we have to have transparency. I think transparency is really, really important. What are the judges looking for? You know, we have. I don't watch football. You, you, football is a very, very black and white rule book, doesn't it? VAR has a very, very black and white rule book. But boxing is this almost like mystique, you know? And then you hear the words every time you watch. It's a good conversation also about scoring, but every single time you watch a fight, what's close, that, that classic line from the commentary is, well, it is subjective. It's either fucking subjective or it's not. It's like, is it subjective or is it based on punches landed? What is it? Yeah. Okay. Do you feel it might have been better, uh, Julian, if the police just got involved, hit them all one morning, five in the morning, locked them all up, got the phones, the bank accounts, and just did a 70, held them 72 hours, you know, got an extension after 24, then another extension, got a few more in the seal squeal. And just rough them up a little bit, you know, just to see if they could dislodge the, this this shower of shite. It, it is. It's the border control, and you know, now I'm at that point. I don't really care what I say, but the, the border control is a very. It's almost like a a hidden society, isn't it? How it works. It's it's absolutely bizarre. Now, in terms of the police getting involved, now, I mean this. I mean this in a nice way. I bet you know a hell of a lot about lot more about law than I do. Um, yeah. No doubt about that. But surely for the police to get involved, this is not a civil matter. This There must be an, a criminal investigation. Yeah. Well, so there's crime, got to be... crime must have taken place. There's something going on because this is the first time in the board's history that they've acted like this, isn't it? And, and, and go, going back, I mean, I jotted some uh, a couple of things down here. I spoke to Robin Reed the other night and I don't know if you remember, uh, Robin Reed fought Otke, and then there was were, were an investigation after. And Otke only fought one more time. And Arthur Abraham fought Miranda the first time. Oh, and the Mars, yeah. Mars Larson, is it? And Otke. Yep. And there, there were another one, I'm not sure if it's an Australian kid or what, but there were investigations into four or five fights, and they were basically Sauerland fights. Yeah. And it was. German police and FBI in Springfield, New Jersey, and it was like a big investigation. Orky was told to retire, wasn't he? He all of a sudden, 34 and 0, 22 mm. world title wins on trot. He had all them split decisions and mandatory decisions in Germany, didn't he? And it, what was going on were nothing short of scandalous. He couldn't punch for toffee. He was told to retire, and they obviously retained the belt, so they became vacant or whatever. Anyway, we all know what went on. Don Robin Reed paid twenty thousand pound for his appeal; he didn't get anywhere. And this this was going on. People were appealing, and constant appeals going in. And but, but from the fighters, Glenn Johnson were unhappy. But the actual ones where they pinpointed that the police looked into were the Reed one, okay, and the, the other ones that I, I spoke about the Miranda. Um, was he Anthony, Anthony Mundine? The Anthony Mundine, the Australian kid, yes. yeah. I think he might have got stopped, though, but there was some... Uh, there, were, there were a few, he read them out to me. And uh, no happened, did it? No happened. But that's the only time I can ever recall 
A ple police getting involved in Europe, apart from that Donkin tournament in the 70s, you know, in the mid 70s. Yeah. 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 Were, it, were it an NBC tournament? Yes. There's right, two semi finals and a final. Two, yeah. Yeah. And there were that, and that sort of like disappeared, didn't it? And that were, there were new FBI, New York, New York's finest, and all that. And police, no, happened of it. And it's like there's just police just leaving to get on with it. So, with this one here now, and the same police are involved, and the question is asking how, how's the commons. I think Smith and his cronies have had to act, and they've never been under this pressure before, have they? No. Nope. Nope. And what they've asked, he looks like Ian John Lewis at four again, but he'll be back. And when he comes back, he'll tiptoe back in and he'll yeah. be welcomed back. And, and we all know that they get looked after. But my argument with it is this he's 500 and odd mile away from Glasgow and he, he's 45 pence a mile here and back. So he, he, he's nearly on a thousand pounds just in petrol money. Then they've got to feed him. Uh, put him in an hotel and pay him. Wouldn't they? Then nobody up north who could do that. Well, it'd be it'd be closer to bring someone in from Europe, wouldn't it? Then or bring Scotland, or fly somebody in, yeah, rather than let him drive up there. So, well, absolutely. So it's the same faces every single time. And and as I've said, it's listen. It's not a witch hunt with Ian John Lewis. I've said before. I thought all three judges put really poor scorecards together. Um, they just got worse. You know, the guy who. The, the judge who had it for by one point to Catterall, that wasn't a great scorecard. They just got progressively worse, didn't they? And yeah. Ian John Lewis has happened to be like the absolute horror, the worst of three, which doesn't make the other two right. It was the worst of three. But I also feel sorry for him because I, I'll, I'll explain why. And I'm probably the only person who says I feel sorry for Ian John Lewis. First of all, he's been made a scapegoat. Second of all, this is a guy who, as an A-star referee and an elite judge, time and time again has made these mistakes. Oh, massive. So if massive. you've got a guy, you know, if the guy on the Titanic who didn't spot the iceberg, if he survived, would you put him on the next cruise liner? It, it's no, it's not going to happen, is it? So it's almost like it's like setting somebody up to fail, isn't it? And then, they never had binoculars, well, though, did he, on Titanic? But in the cruise, well, they, they could have done well. Ian John Lewis and those other two could have done with binoculars on that ringside, couldn't they? Because <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't see what was going on, did they? But do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. how many times are you going to put this guy in a position where he's accused of stopping a fight too early or putting in a really bad scorecard? How many times do you do it? And then, guess what? He puts in another bad scorecard on a major spotlight fight. And then you're all scratching your heads going, how's this happened? We're going to have to investigate him. What are you going to have to wait now to, to, to question, not his integrity, to question his competency? You're waiting now to question his competency. Listen, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy what's happened here. And you, you're putting incompetent people time and time again in on these big shows. And is there any surprise? that people are getting jobbed. And not only are people getting jobbed, people saying, oh, no, rubbish, 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 McGowan. People are walking away from boxing. I, I keep saying I'm going to walk away from boxing. I'm probably addicted to it, and I need to just shut my mouth when I say that. But people are walking away from boxing, and certainly it's like this, the generation, the millennials and Generation X, these guys are, are going to other things. And are they going to UFC because it's more exciting? Or just because it's more on a level and it has more integrity. Wait, did you have to? You, you were, when you're going to make an announcement now, are you going to say something? What you no, it's agree? fine. I was, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to do it, Russell. So, anyone who knows, um, I, I haven't planned this by the way because I just chat to Russell offline with friends. Um, my, my first aid course is due for the Boxing Board of Control, and also my license is due. Now, I did say previously because of the issues with Gary Sykes and now what I felt was real mismanagement of Sykes's mandatories and some other things I've uncovered, which for legal reasons, you know, Russell, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Can't go in, I can't go into these because I just can't. It's as simple as that. But I've uncovered some things and this is not sensationalism and this is not trying to um, come across as, oh, we know something you guys don't. It really isn't that. We, Russell was really... Brilliant putting this on about Sykes and giving us the coverage for what was a we thought was a massive injustice. So you guys have been really supportive in the comments yeah. and in the emails, and you've all been absolutely brilliant. And you've said, you know, keep us up to date. So 
we've we've hit a brick wall. I will just say that we've got to a situation where I can't divulge things because I'm not going to put myself in a difficult position. But ultimately, I feel I can no longer um, pay a license fee and be a border control holder. So I'll be I'll be sending in a letter this week, um, cancelling my first aid course, and I'll be withdrawing my license. And I've done this once before, but this was for different reasons. But you have my word that I'm done now with professional boxing. For anybody out there who's, who turns around and says, well, you're not working with any fighters, McGowan. First of all, I've had lots of offers to work with fighters. It's a personal yeah, choice. Like I've said. It's always a personal choice where I've said no. Um, I am doing some work with Max at the moment because I'm doing it because Max is a good guy. Max needs some input. Max needs some help. So I'm not somebody who attaches myself to elite fighters to make myself look good. I will work with anybody who's a nice guy who wants help, but I'll be doing it just basically in a really informal way. If anybody wants any advice, any help in boxing, I'm happy to give free advice informally, but I won't be doing it as a license holder. I can't subscribe anymore um, to, the, to basically having a license. I just... I just can't do it anymore. My, my morals, my ethics won't be allowed to do that. It's going to break my heart. I've been a license holder for 21 of the last 23 years. I've had some brilliant nights in boxing. I met some brilliant people. Um, but unfortunately, the way it's run, I, I can't look myself in a mirror. And it won't surprise anybody to know the Sykes thing is one thing that's absolutely just ripped Gary's heart out. The belt is one thing. But when I saw what they did to Jack Catterall. I'm like, if you pay your license fee, Jules, if you go on this course, you basically, you, you're condoning this, you, you, you're saying it's fine by me. Um, and it's not fine by me. So, you know, I will be handing my license in and I won't be renewing it. And it, it's, not so, it's not a decision I'll come back to in five, 10 years time. Um, it does come with a heavy heart, but I won't be walking away from boxing as such. But in terms of being a license holder and any official capacity, I'm 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 out of there. I'm done. And well, I do so genuinely wish all boxers and all you know trainers and, and managers. I wish them all the best. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, Kent will be devastated, but uh, I understand your your choice, your reasons, Julian, because it's uh, it's just gone downhill, hasn't it? The, it starts, leadership starts from the top, doesn't it? It does. And you know what? The, the, I've said this before, not every single one, but the, the best part of, of being a coach and the best part of being involved in boxing, I always got a lot more joy from coaching than I did from fighting. Maybe it's because I was better at one than the other. I, I, I don't know. Um, all people who did see me box as an amateur, I've still got a few videos out there that they say, oh, you want bad, mate. You do yourself down a little bit. You were, you were pretty decent, but hopefully I was a decent coach. I've worked with some really good fighters. I've also had struggles with boxing. You know, it does affect your, your mental health, but I've had struggles with boxing, Russell. I don't mind being open on this yeah. channel. It does affect your personal life. It affects your, your health. But I've also worked with fighters, really, really good kids, who for one reason or another haven't made the grade. And generally, it's because of the way the setup is in boxing. So I'll give you an example. I worked with a kid who's really close to my heart. He's the one kid who messages me all the time. He's, he's a really good guy. A guy called Tyrone McInerney. Now, if anybody looks up Tyrone McInerney on BoxRec, you'll see a guy who had five fights, two wins, two draws, and one loss. Now, on the surface, you'll say, that's just an average record. I, If a fighter loses, I will always tell him, he had some stinking decisions. I've actually got one of his fights at my mum's on DVD somewhere. His last fight against a kid called Scott Wolford, where he four rounder, he, he battered Wolford in the third. Wolford was a good kid. He battered him in the third, cut him and dropped him in the fourth round, and he lost 39 38 on a Frank Maloney show as an opponent. And I always remember asking Frank Maloney what had gone on, and he just says, You know how it is, don't you? And the reason I'm saying that is because Tyrone McInerney was. Anyone will tell you he's from the Huddersfield area. They all know him. Mark Hobson, Dale, Rob Dale Robinson, James there. They all know Tyrone. He was an absolute beast. He was a national novice champion. He was a formidable amateur. He started really late. 
and he could have been a really good pro. But what happens with a kid like Tyrone? You get one or two bad decisions. You don't get you get matched hard. You know you know how it goes. If you're not a ticket seller, well. you know where, and it breaks the heart of boxers. So when you see the boxers hearts broken and I also trained a kid who was unbeaten in four fights who couldn't sell tickets and was pulled off shows and he just stopped boxing unbeaten after four fights so I, I've seen it's a long long speech but I've seen kids who have got a lot of talent no one had more talent than Tyro McInerney go nowhere in boxing and it's just because the weight's set up they don't get the opportunities because if they don't sell tickets that is it so I've had one Smack in the mouth after another, after another, after another. And then what's happened with Sykes? And then what happened to Jack, Jack Catterall? And I don't even know Jack Catterall. You just think, I don't want to, I don't want to give you my, my license fee anymore. And you know what, if I do that, then that makes me a hypocrite. That makes me just an absolute out and out hypocrite. So maybe I've thrown the towel in. I've not thrown it in. Straight away, I've thrown it after massive, massive frustrations over a long period of time. I had a gym in Batley. I'm from Dewsbury. That's not on the boxing radar. Um, we had some really good kids come through that gym. Josh Warrington used to train there. He was one of them. And it's like you're just out of the you're out of the mix. You're out of the clique. You're never going to sell huge tickets if you're from Dewsbury or Batley. Yeah, yeah. And you're never going to get those opportunities that these other kids get. And it's it's such a shame. Um, so there's no excuses, but I'm I'm definitely done. I'll still be doing a few bits of work with Max, bless him. Um, but definitely done, Russell. Um, and it's I'll, not there's no there's no bitterness towards the boxing board of control or, or anything like that. There's just I just said the words disappointed disappointed in them. Yeah, I'm disappointed as well. I get I've. Uh... I've got no no fire in me inside me to set about them no more because it's all I've got it all out of my system over the last few weeks. But yeah, uh, I know I know how, how I uh, hold them. I feel like just sticking uh, Robert Smith, Victor Loughlin, Howard Foster, Per Palaki, and Fred and Rose West on the billboard, <laughs> and all at all at an audio or something. That'd be funny, wouldn't it? And making yeah. a joke out of what they are, jokers. Well, uh, it, it is a joke. I've never said for one minute they've got an easy job to do, but you have to be accountable. And you know what? If you are at the head of an organisation and yeah. you are very, very in the public profile, in the public eye, then, sorry, that's what you get paid for. You put yourself out there. It's a little bit like, and this is not an attack, it's a little bit like Ben Davison. He's, he was clearly down and wobbled on a, an IFL interview or so with him. An element of me thought, felt bad for him but ultimately you put yourself out there all the time like you yeah. like yourself We're not on the same kind of platform we put ourselves out here this is your this is your platform so you get people who are gonna who are gonna shoot shoot bullets at you right they're gonna fire bullets at you and you put yourself out there so if you're on if you take a job in public office or you take a job in the public eye like Robert Smith I'm sorry but you're under scrutiny you're getting a wage you're getting paid and you have to be culpable and you have to be answerable. You've got a good some... life. Yeah. Got a very absolutely. good life. A very, a very good life. They're in a very privileged position. They get to see the best fights in the world for free. They're, they're at home, mate, 85, 90 nights a year, you know, Smith and them. So That's unbelievable. You, you're yeah. talking like 270 nights away in hotels around England, Europe, or whatever. They've got a good life, do you know what I mean? And it, yeah. all meals on wheels, it's all paid for. Yeah, and what effectively are they doing apart from just regulating? Ming, ming, mingling, regulating, it's all done for you once a fighter's turn, which is just in case everything falls into place once the doctors have got everything there. After these people in these positions, they don't need to be there, even though they're technically not, it's a, a non-profit making organisation. They're... Uh, they're doing 18, 19, 20 grand a week in expenses. Free gratis, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, isn't it? That that in, in the business I work for would be massively scrutinised and it would be stopped. It's as simple as that. This isn't, is it? This isn't, is it? Because a lot of yeah. promoters pay for a lot of it, don't they? Don't yeah, and it, it looks like, an, it looks like you know, anybody who's listening would think, well, you two guys, you, we say this all the time, you're anti-boxing. Absolutely not anti-boxing. The, be the best thing about boxing are the, are the fighters. 
Yeah, you know, it's about the fighters, in... not about the trainers or the, the, the board of control, but... No, well, tra in... trainers like myself, yeah, you have to... I always, I'm always really self... You know, I praise myself all the time. I praise, by the way, not praise. And I'm always really analytical. Like, I was an amateur boxer and I was all right. Yeah, but I wasn't good enough to go pro and make an impact. So I had my opportunity. I had my little tiny, tiny day in the spotlight as an amateur on those local shows. And then it's, you become a coach and it's about the fighter. It's as simple as that. It's not about the coach or the, the agent or the manager or all these people, you know. And you see all these trainers and managers and agents spending more airtime on IFL and all these boxing social than the actual fighters. And it's the building their own profile. Guess what, right? Without the fighters, there's not a sport. There just isn't a sport. And without good fighters, there's a really poor sport. And people just need to just... Who would have thought we'd be, would have thought we'd be having 40 minutes sit down with nutritionists on IFL? Well, I haven't seen it, Brad. <laughs> Do you know I, what? And any people would say to me, you're old school. I'm definitely not old school. Anybody who's worked with me in the gym knows I'm not old school, right? But look, Chris Aston, Chris Aston is old school, but he's also a very experienced coach and manager who's been around the game. I Chris too, always well, wasn't it? Yeah, Chris, Chris was. Chris, Chris was a. He was an ex-pro, but it's un, not everybody knows this. But Chris was an actual better Thai boxer than he was a. a Trained Carl uh, Thompson, didn't he? Yeah, he was a very, very good Thai boxer. Did he win Chris World Thompson. Muay Thai? World Muay Thai champion Carl Thompson, one of the cut. It will be that, David. That's Day. correct. Well, Chris, Chris Aston was world ranked as a Thai boxer, really, really good. And Chris was like, say, he was old school, but Chris used to say, "It's not science." To the, to the nth degree in terms of nutrition and strength conditioning. It's not science. It's like he's got so many fighters ready for 12 rounders, made the weight, they've been strong, they've been successful. He said, you eat well, you eat healthy. You just drop it down on the final fight week. You'd cut the water intake on the last day or two. You make the weight, you, you strength conditioning. Yes, there are certain things that have come into boxing, what's a bit safer now for people's joints and all this stuff. But when did strength condition have more sessions than boxing coaches? When, when did that happen? And that's where the likes of Chris and I used to chat about this all the time. And then for anybody who used to question that, I'd say, well, I, I won't name the fighters, but I had a couple of trainers over the years say to Chris and I what we should be doing with some of the fighters who were in Chris's gym. So Tyrone Nurse... Gary Sykes, Tyrone was trained by Chris. Gary Sykes trained by me, but we all kind of mucked him. We all did our stuff together. None of that, none of those fighters were blowing after their ass after four rounds. And we had people and other trainers and managers and, and SNC people saying to Chris and I saying, Oh, you should be doing this and you should be making the weight like that. And they had fighters out there blowing out their ass after three rounds. And then it's like, well, you never saw Tyrone Nurse or Gary Sykes fading after six rounds. So I'll tell you what, you stick to what you do, which is working working at a J JD and doing your PTs and working with you know people who have got more money than sense. You carry on doing that and you leave the boxing to the boxing people. I'm not saying boxing trainers can't improve their knowledge of diet and nutrition. I'm not stuck in the, I'm not stupid, I'm not stuck in the dark ages. But you know, Sykes used to do strength conditioning, but it was all briefed by myself, and it was only a couple of times a week as supplementary. It was that much of his work. Everything else was around his punching output, output and his boxing output and the drills, the boxing drills and all that type of thing. So, yeah, sorry, that's a long answer, but uh, nutritionist getting 40 minutes on IFL, I mean. Tyrone Nurse always did rounds well. Didn't he always a good... Good dope well, rounds, kind of. Chris Aston, what Chris did was he, he, he had Tyrone sparred a lot and he, he had a lot of ring craft. He, he, we call him T. So T had, T had a lot of ring craft. And I probably handed up for Chris maybe in 10 of Tyrone's first 20 fights. He used to fight on Sykes, Bills, and me and Chris did tons of corners together. I, I'd help him, he'd help me. Um, we, we kind of thought the same way about a lot of things, and then in other things, in other areas, we didn't, but we always had a mutual respect. Um, we fell out like people do, but not major, not not bitchy falling out or girly falling out, or that, that like some people, you know, we'd fall out amongst ourselves and then we'd put it right. 
But Tyrone Nurse would box on these four rounders, and sometimes he'd fight the same guy two or three times, but he kept him busy. Chris always understood that activity yeah. was like key for fighter development. So, so T had a really easy first 15, 20 fights, but he did so because he was young, he was developing, he only turned pro when he was 18, he, he hadn't anywhere near his physical prime. And he, he became a British champion. So for anybody who said he's only domestic level, when people say only domestic level, trust me, British, ta- British champion is a very high level in boxing. It, it's massive, okay? There's only European and world level before you get to the absolute pinnacle. That, that if you think of a, a jar to become British champion, that's like in, you're in the two percentile of elite pros. And T was a, T was a good kid. They're all, they're all good kids. Yeah. Uh, do you feel that we're spending a lot of time these days talking about things that are happening outside the ring rather than the actual fights, uh, Julian? Yeah, absolutely. You know, like uh, um, the judging, the the rankings, uh, the you know the step asides, and the media, and you know he said, she said. And, you feel like that that's distracting away from what fights are being made because there's not a lot of good fights are being made. Whereas if you back up years ago, it wasn't about that, it was about the fights. You know, like that era you were from, you know, when you had like your Sykes, your Josh yeah. Wales, your Tyrone Nurses, your your crawlers coming through, and you know, you know, people like that. You feel? Yeah, there's there's way too much um salad dressing now, isn't there? And there's actually not a yeah. lot of sub- substance. And that's, it, it's such a shame. I mean, we've got, I mean, I heard Anthony Joshua, I know not slamming Joshua, by the way, but I heard Joshua say something about, is, is, if he doesn't fight Usyk, which obviously that, you know, our thoughts and our prayers are with Usyk and his countrymen, that's the most yeah. boxing thing on his fucking radar right now. Yeah. And let's be honest, who cares about boxing, what's happening in the world right now? They're know? calling out oh. Usyk's manager to ask him what they're doing with his belts, aren't they, Eddie, the other day, didn't they? I mean, it just shows, doesn't it? You know, Alexander Usyk, we, we hope he stays safe and that, that, that goes for everybody. But in terms of Joshua, I heard him saying, you know, he'll have an interim fight because he, he wants to keep busy. And Joshua said something like, you know, activity is key. And I'm thinking, activity is key. You fight once a flood. It's like, what, what have you what have you boxed three times in the last, like... Well, he activated it October 8th, the rematch, and they've been dragging it out, haven't they, waiting for war and all this, haven't they? So it's five... Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, it's five months and three days ago they've activated that rematch, and they're still not... But they've had I plenty of think... time before war, haven't they? Plenty of time. I know that lots of... um, Lots of the other YouTube channels watch what you do, but I, I personally think that and it, it's... All these people have access to Eddie Earn and Anthony Joshua, and this includes them too as well. I think it's in really bad taste even asking about the Usyk rematch right now. This guy is somebody who's on the front line. He yeah. was as well over there, I've seen it. He was on the front line. It's not publicity. He's a, he's a proud Ukrainian. He's on the front line. And people should stop asking about... People should be now saying to AJ, when's your next fight and who is it against? Because let's not delay anymore by saying... Well, we're still hoping for the Usyk rematch in May. I've never heard as much rubbish in my life. That oh, guy yeah. has got other things going on right now, important things. The last thing on Alexander Usyk's mind now will be a rematch with Joshua or even boxing. Boxing's not something what will be on his mind right now. You know, you, you won't see the Klitschko's at the moment talking, doing boxing social interviews, will they? Those guys have got... Serious things going on right now. And you know, listen, we're still talking about boxing. You can't not talk about something just because of what's going on. But I just think when people are asking Joshua about the Usyk fight and when they're even commenting on it, I think it's in really bad taste. They should say, our thoughts are with Usyk, our thoughts are with the Ukraine. And let's not, dis- let, don't ask me that question right now. And if you keep asking me that, that question, I'm just going to blacklist you because I just think it's in bad taste. Well, Usyk's done Chisora, Bellew and uh, AJ, hasn't he? <laughs> he didn't really break sweat, did he? Uh, I mean, any of those. Not, types, none, of, none of them. Although, apparently, the, uh, the Chisora, Chisora. Fight, it was it was life and death, was that, wasn't it? According to Bellew and, to, and uh, Dave Penfold Coldwell. I remember yeah. watching it thinking, 
I couldn't decide if I'd give 10 of the rounds to Usyk or 11 of the rounds. I just couldn't decide. It was like, it, did, it never missed Chisora, did it? Or was it was just touch, no. touch, touch, pivot, touch. And it was just, I mean, Chisora was brave and as hard as nails like he always is. But if that fight was close, I, I, it, it just shows, doesn't it? Why when, you, when you're a pundit or when you're working for a broadcaster, you shouldn't be commenting or commentating on your mate's fights. Yeah, just, that's, I did have, they have learned from that because they've been doing it since then. And so no, no, it's been learned from it, has it? And what, what I also, people always cheer at ringside and people shout comments, but what I also didn't like about that was because that took place during the pandemic, you know, you've got Chisora and his coaches and you've got people literally, like Bellew was one of them, screaming nonstop at the side, telling them what to do, coaching them through the fight. It's like, let the coach do his job. And yeah. I, I, when I was watching that, I really didn't like that. I'm thinking, not that it would change the result, but if, if you're Derek Chisora, who are you listening to? you got Caldwell, you got Bellew, you've got six or seven voices screaming, Eddie Hearn screaming for Chisora, telling him what to do. It's like, who are you listening to? That just scrambles your brain. And those instructions carried a lot more because of the pandemic. Because right. it's hard to hear, it's hard to hear anybody else apart from your coach who's literally ringside when there's 15,000 people there. But when you're in an empty arena and you've got all those people screaming, Chisora's head must have been absolutely frazzled that night. Do you want me to tell you why they were screaming? Because they didn't want to put Joshua in with Usyk, the ones who uh, Chisora. Yeah, get, getting beat at any cost, wasn't it? Um, they did everything they could, mate, to win that fight. And it's been going on for years. And let me tell you, they manipulated all sorts in that pandemic, in that little garden of Eddie's dad's. But okay then, moving on from that then, uh, Peter's uh, said to me that they put uh, Yui's name forward for AJ for an interim opponent and Chisora, Chisora's uh, price is turned out of it and uh, they've not they've knocked back from AJ, looks like they might be going for Otto Wallin. What do you think to that for a fight, Otto Wallin against AJ? I saw Otto Wallin's last fight, did he have a six round or something or a, yeah. an eight, I can't, I can't remember what recently and this people will say you talk stupid this was this guy's got a, a, a he's only got one defeat on his ledger i thought i was watching white collar boxing i'm just being honest it was like dreadful level this auto wall and it was like people say oh, he gave tyson a fight blah blah blah. no he cut tyson fury um and if that's anthony joshua's next fight i don't have an issue with that as long as you call it what it is which is just a learning fight keep him busy but don't, if he's only fighting once every six months, then you have to bring a good name. If the guy's fighting three or four times a year, I don't have an issue with him fighting a knockover job like, like, like Wallin. Um, but I thought he looked awful last time. For me, like I say, it's about activity. I said the same thing with Fury. I just want to see Tyson Fury fight. Oh, Joshua looked awful last time, you mean, yeah? No, Wallin, Otto Wallin. I, Wallin, yeah. Yeah. I, do, I, I did think he looked like a white collar boxer. And if that's uh, one of the lower top 10 heavyweights in boxing or 10 to 15 heavyweights in boxing, we're in a real problem because he looked awful. He looked absolutely dreadful, but I've no issue with Joshua fighting him, to be honest, but Huey Fury won't get the knock. And I'll tell you why Huey Fury won't get the knock. Um, I'm not suggesting, by the way, because if you ask me who I think would win between Anthony Joshua and Huey Fury, because I'm always honest with you, I think Anthony Joshua would beat him. Yep. Yeah. I just think he would beat him. But the thing with Huey Fury, he's a really long night for anybody. He's got a, he's got a high output. He's got a lot of ring craft. He hits hard enough to let you know he's in there, but he's got that ring craft. You know, he's got those little defensive things that he does. He's been around boxing since he was a kid and he's had a lot of ring time. So, so he might not have had hundreds of fights. You just know he's always sparring. He's always in the gym. And he's, he's a long, tricky night for Joshua. And if anybody can make Joshua look bad, then it's uh, Huey Fury. Do I think he'd beat Joshua, as I've said? No. But do I think he'd give him a fight and potentially make him look bad? Absolutely. So he won't get the phone call at all. And Chisora's obviously, uh, they're not going to put 
It, it, you and Chisora's pricing is sent out for, for you with, and they're not going to put Chisora in with AJ, are they? Because the baits aren't they, and all that. Kind yeah, of thing, but. It'd, be, it'd be very cynical matchmaking if they did that, wouldn't they? I think it's a the the Otto Walling fight is one what's likely going to happen, and they'll say, oh, he's a southpaw, and you know, I've, I've learned how to fight southpaws now, I've got my new coach, and they'll be all look, it's a it's a PR thing, isn't it? Um, yeah. If you want a southpaw fight, Louis Ortiz, I mean, he's what is he, 57 years old or something, so you still got to fight, fight, fight Ortiz. Okay, then, uh, Josh Warrington, you've trained him, you've worked with him, you know, his family, his dad, and that. Lara, uh, there doesn't seem to be the same energy to get this third fight with Lara as there were when they were having the second one. Uh, Eddie said that Lara's going to be out for six to nine months with that cut. Lara came back, he's fought in under six months. Warrington hasn't fought. They could have put them in together, couldn't they? Yeah, well, first of all, because I'm, I'm always honest, I Josh spent about two years at the Central Boxing Club. Mark Early owned the gym, but the kind of central brand, I was a head coach there. But Sean O'Hagan always trained Josh. I helped him. Bit like Nicky oh, yeah, Manners. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Bit like Nicky Manners and Abid. I always helped Josh and I've done a lot of work with him. But the kind of brains behind it was always Sean. Um, now, in terms of what's going on, I know Sean well, really well. I mean, yeah, um, I mean you've trained with him. You know, like Robin yeah, yeah, exactly. trained I've, with Yui and that. Don't mean say yeah. you were in charge. Yeah. No, no, yeah. I've taken him on the pads 20, 30 times. Yeah, I've done yeah. work with... Yeah. What used to happen was I'd do work with Josh and Sykes when Sean couldn't make it. Sean would do Sykes and Josh when I couldn't make it, and we'd, we'd always mix it up. But yeah, Josh was Josh was at Central two years, probably sparred bloody hell 150 times at that gym, um, and the situations it's business, it's purely business because I saw Lara at the weekend. I've no issue saying this to to Nikki or to Sean or to Josh. Why would you want to fight Lara again, other than you were absolutely driven by revenge? Because the guy is a fucking beast, but he's getting better now, isn't he? He had a hard, hard road when he was young. He got beat a couple of times when he was, what, 19, 20. He's still a young guy, is Lara. You know, he's, what is he, 23, 24? He's an absolute beast. And, and I said this about Conor Ben and Kel Brook, saying, why would, Con why would Kel Brook want a part of Conor Ben? The last thing he wants is a young, hungry, aggressive lion. Now, Josh has already been... Badly knocked out by Lara. The second fight, we, we, we can't really say too much about the second fight because it, what happened, happened. But what you can see is Josh, brilliant fighter, brilliant ambassador for boxing. He's had a really good career in which he's probably tell you he's overachieved. But Josh is not at his, in his prime right now. He might be just on that 5% dip from where he was you know, two, three years ago. Obviously, he's had a lot, lot of inactivity as well. And if you were Josh, when you've got two kids at home and family, you'd be now looking for the fights that make sense. It doesn't, it doesn't help the fans. We're not interested in the fights that make sense. But it's, it's one of those where you've got to get the fights that make sense, where you're going to have the least risk for the most money and get out of boxing safer. Because I've always said this, Russell, when Josh Warrington's at home, if he has any injuries in boxing or has any any issues because of a long boxing career, it's his wife and his kids who have to suffer. It's not the fans who like to see a tear up and it's not those guys. So as a fan, I'd like to see Warrington fight Lara again. Yeah. If I was advising Josh Warrington, I will not go anywhere near Lara. It's all wrong for him. He's proved it. And they're on the ascendancy now. One guy is going up the hill. One guy is going down the hill. And even if Josh were to beat Lara... It's still going to be a hard night for him. And uh, you don't want to do that at the end of your career. Do you feel that uh, Sean O'Hagan and Nick Manners might not like you saying that Josh is coming down ill? <laughs> well, they're, they're realists. And yeah, I'll, Nick, I'll, I'll Nick is a realist. Yeah, Nick Manners is a realist. Yeah, Nick, Nick is a good bloke, really good bloke. I've, I've known Nicky years. I've known Sean a long, long time since Josh was about 16, 15, 16, 16 when I met Sean. Sean and I have conversations offline, not spoke about six months actually, but we go out for dinner sometimes and, and stuff. Sean would probably be more pissed off if I didn't speak my mind. Yeah. He speaks his mind. You've, you've heard interviews with Sean. Sean doesn't give a fuck what people think. He speaks his mind. So if I turn around and says, 
No, no, I think Josh would do him in three and uh, Lara's running scared. Sean would probably think, what, what, what fucking know what you're doing? So I'm not saying anything damning. I'm saying, yeah, 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 listen, yeah. if you look at Ricky Hatton, right, if you look at fighters who have, this is how boxing genetics goes and, and boxing lifespans. The fighter who's got that, you know this, Russell, the fighter who's got that aggressive, high work rate, high tempo style, yeah, yeah. always has a shorter window than the fighter who's got more defensive savvy, who throws less punches, who's a little bit smarter in terms of ring general shit. Bernard Hopkins, Floyd Mayweather. So Josh Warrington at 30, 31 now, he, he can't be in his prime. He might be looking good in the gym. He can't be in his prime. He has to be on that downslide. That doesn't, that's not saying he's shot. That's saying he's probably on a, you know, 95% of the fighter as he was. I remember him on the way up. Bloody hell, he, the kid had so much energy. It was insane. And everybody, I'm 50 now. I go on the pads now and again. God, I'm creaking around like an old man. And none of us, people say, you know, you know when people use that ridiculous thing and they say, age is just a number, age is just a number. How many 50-year-old world champions are there in boxing? Age, age is just a number. It's something we tell ourselves to make ourselves feel better. Yeah. Age is just a number. But it's nonsense. I used to do three, four-mile runs when I was an amateur, and I would fly up Halifax Road every night. It was like that. Struggle driving up there now, mate. It's like, it's just, you can't do the stuff you did. And Josh will be no exception. He's, a, he's an elite athlete. He's a former world champion. He's a phenomenal athlete. But Josh... And anybody else cannot do the things that you did. And it's not, this is not Josh Warrington who turned pro late and he had a brief amateur career. Josh turned pro at 18 years old. Yeah. That's a long he won, career. He won everything, lot. didn't he? he? won everything. Oh, he did won the lot. The British, Commonwealth, European, all the international well, yeah. masters and stuff. You know, and what, what a, a trophy cabinet Josh must have. And oh, fantastic. He, he, he was also a good amateur as well. He, he beat some really good kids in the amateurs. Josh was a little bit like what I talked about earlier with uh, Tyra McInerney. He was the kid who beat a lot of top amateurs, but never got the call up. You know, never got the GB call up, the England call up. Um, I think Tyrone Nurse, going back to Tyrone, I forget the number, so forgive me if I'm wrong. But Tyrone Nurse, as an amateur, he beat something like eight or nine national champions, and he never got called up for England. Never. I know that. There you go. And it just shows, and Josh was the same. I think Josh, at one point, beat world-ranked amateur in a, in a on an in, it wasn't an international fight with a club show or something, and and he beat a world-ranked amateur, and uh, he still didn't get the call up. So I went pro at eighteen. That's why Tyrone Nurse went pro at eighteen because you're like, Do you know what, my face doesn't fit for whatever reason. I've got a style that's more oh, yeah. similar to the pros, and it turned out. But yeah, yeah J- Josh is a good kid. Love the kid. Wish him all well. Um, I think he beats Martinez. Don't fight, don't fight Lara. Um, okay. And that yeah. goes for a lot. That goes for Gallard as well. Don't fight Lara. Stay away oh, from Oh, I was, I was about to come to that. I think that uh, I think Galahad has a style to beat Lara because he, he's, he's frustrating, isn't he? You know, like an Andre Ward, mini Andre Ward, and just take that power, take that big right hand off him. And I, I just think that Galahad's got a style to. To, to do a job on Lara, and I'd like to see Galahad in the uh, Lara, but nobody seems to be calling this guy out, do they? It's, it's an interesting fight. Um, I just think there's something about the momentum and the ferocity of, of Lara right now. I mean, he, he really got hurt, you know, last Saturday. You could see him not badly wobbled, but he got hurt. He got nailed with some massive shots. But let's not underestimate, the kid he was fighting was 19 and 1, but records are for DJs. They don't mean too much for me. But that kid who Lara beat last week was a good kid. You could just see. Yeah, yeah. He was yeah. a really oh, good... Yeah. It, was like Ed, Ed, it was like Eddie put him in with somebody to get him beat, wasn't it? It was almost like there was a chance that he might get turned over, then I don't have the problem of Lara anymore. Well, you've got the problem of Lara right now. Um, so it was all hugs and well done's at the end, wasn't it? But I just think there's something about that kid. What happened... I'll tell you, it reminds me of Lara. And I'm going to show my age, everybody out there now. People look at someone like Lara and say, he's been stopped, he's been stopped in the first round, he's, he's had a couple of losses. When you're 17, 18, 16, 17, 18 in Mexico, you turn over really, really young and yeah. you get matched really, really hard. 
And that happened to Pepino Cuevas, the, the welterweight, destructive welterweight WBA champion who made about 16 defences of his title. Lara reminds me right now of Pepino Cuevas. He's got that kind of primitive raw style, huge puncher, explosive when he lets his hands go. He's like, honestly, he's like a reincarnation of Cuevas. And he was an absolute wrecking machine, was that guy. I know Tommy Ernst did a hell of a number on him and Duran, but at that window in the late 70s, um, Quavers was an absolute fucking destroyer. The only difference now is the frequency that people fight. I mean, that's the first time Lara's fought in six months. Yeah. Is it going to be another? I know he had the injury, so-called, but is it going to be another six months before we see him fight? So he's for me, he's the kind of live wire in the division right now who nobody's going to be ringing him up. And again, Kid Galahad against Lara. Yeah, convention says that Galahad would be able to handle him with all that beautiful boxing skill. But the thing is, you'll never sicken him. And at some point, you're going to engage. And we saw with Martinez, didn't we? And Galahad, he got to an age, he got cracked by two massive shots, and he got wiped out. Now, he'd have to keep on his bike against Lara. And I don't, I don't think he could do that for 12 rounds, Russell. No, oh, yeah. No. Okay. Uh, Dave Allen. Uh... He's going to fight, uh, I forgot the guy's name now, he's fighting now. They're saying it's a decent ish fight. I'm just going to look on the phone. Okay. Uh, Dave Allen fights on the uh, 19th. Uh, that's Dennis Shaw. Sure. And I'm not, I think it's on fight zone. I'm not sure. Have you, uh, have you got your phone there, Julie? Because mine's turned off. Yes, mate. Right, could you just put Dave Allen box wrecking and just have a look at the guy who's fighting? I forgot his name. Mel. If I can, box wreck's become a bloody nightmare to log on now, hasn't it? Lately, yeah. Uh, well, should Dave Allen be fighting? Like, you know, after he, he come back and that, didn't he? And, you know, it's obviously he lived at back of me for years and years. I was number 76, he was 62. He lived at back of me on the same street. And oh, he's fighting at, no, no, this guy's five and eight. Millen, Millen Pownav. That's it, is it? Yeah, yeah. He's five and eight. I mean, I'm not saying the records, everything. Really. People keep telling me it's a quote. It's an hard fight for him and that. I keep saying, I'm blowing him away. But it depends where he's at in his career, doesn't it? But it, it, it's a bit of a come down from not being off of 300 well, grand to fight the bar. I'm going to put this, I don't go, I don't obsess in records. I'm just going to put this into perspective now. So Dave Allen's next opponent, yeah? Yeah. Two fights ago, got beat by Mladen Manev, who was one and five. Exactly. <laughs> but the, but the, 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 the talking, the talking it up is like a 50-50. I mean, where's Dave at in his career if that's a 50-50? I mean, what are his aspirations? Is it just to get another win? Or... I, don't, I don't get it. Where, where's this 50-50 coming from? It's painful, mate, isn't it? This guy's lost to debutants. He's lost a couple of kids. No, he's dog shit, mate. Yeah. Not me uh, disrespectful to boxers, by the way. I'm talking about as a as a live opponent. Okay. Uh, uh, we'll cut all that uh, nonsense out from the last few days that I've had. <laughs> this this lunatic who keeps putting videos out about me. Have you seen them? Oh, the guy I've seen. Uh, me, I, oh. I, 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 I know who you're talking about. I didn't know who it was. Um, I'm not going to get involved in a war with him, but I didn't know who it was. And then I remembered because he used to be on Ben Doughty's page a long, long time ago, and he it, and it was called something else. So. Yeah, it was Action Jackson or Apollo. Some, well, he did. He, he put something really bad out about Dean Powell when he died. And uh, he just disappeared. He, he was mocking the death of Dean Powell, and he disappeared him for years, and then he, he's resurfaced, hasn't he? I mean... I didn't know that. I only met yeah. Dean Powell once, and Dean Powell actually yeah. I met him the night Sykes got knocked out in the prize fire. And it was so lovely with Sykes, you know, talking to him afterwards and just brilliant, just such a genuine man. So if you, anybody who would knock anybody who's died is pretty horrendous, but that's, you don't, you just don't do that. I don't know this guy. Um, what I do know, yeah, what I have picked up from this and I've seen a couple of things just you try and get up to speed with things if you're talking about punching a man in front of his wife and kids oh, yeah, yeah. 
then it's probably not worth her time, really, is it? Um, well, he had, his all, all, he had his opportunity, didn't he, yesterday? All I would say to him is this, and I don't know him, and he might watch this, he might not, I can't care less, it doesn't make a difference to me, yeah. First of all, you're going to challenge a man who's 51, 52 to a boxing match. Um, get a grip, right? Just decide what you want to be, yeah? So I know what you're talking about now because I've, I've looked, seen a few things in the last few days, right? Do you want to be a presenter, broadcaster, um, YouTuber? Do you want to be a boxer? You said on one video you'd applied to be a manager, a promoter, a all these other licenses. You're going to go to the Olympics. You're going to go to the Olympics in 2016. Oh, man. You're six foot two. Well, then I'm seven foot two. So you just got to decide. I'm not going to go into detail because I couldn't care less about these people because look, social media does that. You know, you've been accused of stuff. People yeah. say stuff to you about you, about me. I'm not bothered. But all it boils down to is this, right? I'm not threatening anybody. I'm not going to punch anybody in front of their wife and kids. Yeah, I'm just a quiet guy who goes up, who's goes on about his business. But ultimately, right, you're gonna talk and give it this and give it this and give it this. You have to be prepared to back it up. And the video I saw, his ass went. Yeah, yeah. Um, Shame, it? And you know what? I I would. The one thing I will say about him seriously, yeah is I think he's a, the kid's a bit mixed up, so I'm not going to go hard on him. I don't know him. Yeah. He's, he's definitely got his problems. Well, I'm glad he didn't come to that because I didn't really... You don't, you don't the want to cameras do all over the place. There were a cop car, you know, parked smack opposite. I thought, you been set right. up here or what? You know, you, you don't know what... I had all sorts going through my head. And uh, I thought, well, if we're clipping me here, it's going to look like Mullion, but what if he clips me? I mean, I'm in a predicament here. I've got Max there, all in camera. I thought, I'm going to play this here. Luckily, his arse went. I didn't have to be rolling about up for or, or hitting somebody or whatever. You know, it, uh, it can escalate, can't it? And yeah. since then, he obviously, he's, he's gone off on it. He's got what he wanted. He's got reaction. And he's just put a video out just now saying he's going to get more reactions out me and put more videos out. So the guy's obviously a fruit loop, isn't he? <laughs> well... Yeah, it, it, oh. people like that can be can be quite. You wear your heart on your sleeve, but you ultimately you do what you say you're going to do, whether yeah. people like. Oh well, yeah. You, you, you're not proclaiming. See, one thing you're not doing right is you're not saying that you're going to fight Tommy Fury, are you? Now, the 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 reality is, yeah, the the difference between I've been in boxing a long, long time. Yeah, I had a, I had my own level a long time ago, right? The difference between someone who's pretty poor as an amateur and had a couple of amateur fights and from what I've seen, pretty poor and had a couple of white collar fights from someone who's a, a professional light heavyweight, who's a huge light heavyweight. Who's away to Tommy is a cruiser. Yeah, Tommy's a big unit, isn't he? He's, a, he's, a, he's an Adonis of a man. And whilst he didn't have a massive amateur pedigree and he's only had a few pro fights, I can't explain to you, it's called Michael, this guy, I can't explain to you the, the difference between where you're at and to where he's at. So what I would say is if you're serious about boxing, okay, pick up your amateur career again, go to a, an England boxing amateur club, don't bother with the white collar stuff, stop calling people like Tommy Fury out and I'm sure he's called other people out as well. Stop calling 50 year old men out and then doing nothing about, it, nothing about it when they're stood in front of you. Stop doing that, go to an amateur gym, yeah, train with amateurs, um, Going to if you're that good, going to the novice ABAs under 10 fight developments. Let's see how we get on. And then if you win the novices, we're going to the uh, under 20 bouts. Yeah. Then we maybe put you in the senior elites, then put you on the podium squad, and then you can fight for your country, all this kind of stuff. I mean, I'm being a bit tongue in cheek, but everybody wants to box, but nobody wants to do it consistently at amateur, amateur gyms. And I always wonder why that is. And I'm not I'm not knocking the guy. Social media, isn't it? It's it's social, it's social, social media, right? It's it's the Andy Warhol thing, isn't it? It gives everybody an inflated ego. ego. You know, had I been an amateur in today's world, what I would have done is I would have just dismissed all my losses, yeah, and I would have just taken clips on my phone of my training and hitting the speedball and done these videos on Instagram. I, I'd have looked like Floyd Mayweather, but shame, I just didn't fight like Floyd Mayweather. 
And this is what happens is social media gives you a platform, right or wrong. This is a social media platform that you have. Now, you know what you want to do, don't you? You're a, you're a, you, you, do a, you have a boxing platform. You talk about boxing. Yeah. You haven't applied to be a timekeeper or a boxing manager. You're not saying I'm going to be a boxing agent. You're not saying I'm a boxer. You, you're quite specific about what you're about, what your mission is. Yeah. But all these people who want to be 20 different things, all things to all men, it's like a desperation to be Thanks. involved. And if you want to be a journalist, and I might as well just say this, I saw a couple of interviews he did because I was looking at him for the purpose of what had gone on with you to say, is that the same guy? If you want to be a journalist, really serious, take taken really seriously, you might need to just polish up on what you do. You might need to be a little bit more interesting with the questions that you're asking and maybe, and he did fall into one of the traps when I saw two of his interviews yesterday. He talked about himself. If you're interviewing... Terry Harper, or you're interviewing, um, you know, all these fighters, you need to talk about them and ask them about their career and not say, you know, I'm a boxer too, and I sparred him, and I want to go, I want to go to the Olympics, I want to do this. You need to show an interest in your subject. If you only get three minute window given by whoever gives you that that pass, that press, let's get some interesting questions out there. Let's be more pointed with your questions. And I think I sound like I'm knocking and I'm not. I think the guy just needs a little bit of mentoring. Um, and it's a shame you've fallen out, mate, because he might have been able to learn something. Fallen out? It's not even me, mate. I, oh. Well, you know, you know what I mean. Listen, you gave him I kicked off, him off my you? channel, didn't I? I kicked him off my channel for saying... Ben Doughty kicked him off his... Ben Doughty kicked him off his page. You kicked him off your channel. So we've, we've got a consistent thing there. And what you also have to do, Michael, is you have to be... <sighs> You have to be careful not to upset people for the sake of it. So Kel Brooks sparred with him, didn't he? Yeah. And he gave, yeah. he gave him some time, some precious time. It wasn't really a spa, was it? It was moved, he moved around with him. It, it, it moved around with him. And I'm sure everybody would be you know, open to what went on. It's just someone just giving someone a bit of time. Dom Ingle welcomed you into his, into his gym. They was very gracious with you. They give you publicity and views you would have never got in your own right as a boxer. And that was a really good thing. Yeah. And then he was exposing Kelbrook the other day, and I'm like, oh, don't do that. I mean, he's turned his back on you, but you're turning your back on some of these top fighters who you've... What, what are you trying to do? You've got to be careful, because the one bit of advice I would give him, I mean, you showed this the other night, give him a lot of advice to say I wasn't going to talk about him, but you put me on the spot, I'll answer. The one bit of advice I'd give him is... Be really careful which pros you upset because some pros will act professionally and will just walk away and not bite. Other pros, some pros who I, who I can think of, if you upset them, they might, they might just have a little word with you on the quiet and it won't end well for you. It won't end well for you. Yeah. So I, I, would be, I would be really careful. I'm not talking about someone like you or I me. Mean, I'm, I'm 50 and riddled with arthritis. I'm talking about there are people out there even I know that there are people out there I wouldn't want to upset in boxing. Well, I uh, I banned him because he said David they were a drug cheat. So I said you can't come on. Kevin said, "Look, no, whoa, don't have him on again. You can't do that. No problem." And he took it wrong way, and that's just the way it goes. And uh, he keeps making videos about this ban. He's got a well, look. Ben Doughty banned him. Loads of people have banned him. And from what I'm hearing, Matthew might be getting, he might not be welcome at their shows now after today. So, look, it's. He's got issues and that, but uh, yeah. I think it's just a shame that I don't really do that many good deeds in my life, but I've gone and got a kid from under a bus shelter at Winkerbank bus station. Ingalls won't let him stop there. They won't daft, will they? You can leave your, you can leave your rucksack here, but you can't sleep here. Dom Ingalls, no fool, mate. No, Dominic's seen it all before, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do what Dom, no I'm going to do what Dominic Ingle couldn't do, will really, yeah. Well, look what, look what happened. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, Dom Dom doesn't suffer fools in any way, shape, uh, or form. I've put uh, there's a I put it to bed this Sunday. I think the video comes out, and I think it, it needs. Put, I think it needs put into bed, and he needs he needs to put it to bed. You need to. Well, put he it to won't bed. do if he wants to keep going on and on and on, trying to get views and probably get a feel quick. Because yeah, I've really got no one. I feel sorry for him really. And I I, mean, I feel sorry for him. Anything I've said about him is not disparaging. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm I genuinely know. I'm saying to, to you, Michael, 
decide what you want to be. Yeah. And, you know, if you want to be a fire, concentrate on fighting. And any spare time you've got, use that to train. Yeah. You train an amateur gym, learn your craft. You're knocking on a little bit, so you need, you need to get a move on. And then if you want to get an amateur career, you'll, get, you'll be taken more seriously if you actually want to turn professional. But what happens is boxing's might come across as a tough industry, and there are tough guys in boxing, but boxing's also an industry that closes up when people try to piss them off. So if you're going to start to piss people off, it won't be that, won't be that long before Eddie Hearn says, done. Warren says, done. And then before you know it, you welcome at no shows and you just become a bit of a laughing stock. So I would say, polish up on your questions, okay? Um, it's a, you, you, your videos are a bit boring, so maybe just try and, and that's not being, being rude, I'm just being honest. You Just try and learn your craft, either as a boxer or even as a broadcaster, but you have to decide what you want to do and you have to decide what you want to be. And again, listen, I'm not slagging you off, mate. I don't want you calling me out. 30 years since I've been in the ring. But you just decide what you want to be. Yeah, but definitely, definitely, definitely don't turn on people who have shown you a good turn. Uh, don't do that because that's a shit trick. It's a shit trick. Well, it's one of them things, isn't it? He, uh, he got a rise out of me yesterday and that with that. And, uh, and me and Max, like, she said, should we have a wit round for him if he comes over all right? And he was still the same yesterday. And sometimes you can take an horse to water. You can't let the horse drink it. So... It's unlucky for him. He's, uh, he's out there on his own now. He's doing a Freddie Flintoff on a pedalo at Middle at Sea on his own. Road to nowhere. And it's, yeah, it's a shame because it, it's such a, you have a large platform. We've been on your show a few times. He's, he's going to these press conferences. You're very privileged to be given this platform when you're actually, and I mean this in a nice way, in boxing, you're nobody at all. You, you, you might think you're somebody, but you I trained a British champion, a two-time British champion. I was nobody in boxing, yeah? I had 14 amateur fights. I was nobody in amateur boxing, nobody. Not on the, not on the radar, not on the landscape. But you are absolutely nowhere in boxing, so you've got a very privileged position. You need to be thankful for those people who's given you a platform. You need to be appreciative, and you need to be respectful. You need to be respectful to them. And Coog Coogan got him in. Coogan has got him on board because I think when Coogan first started out, he was doing a bit with Coogan or knocking right. about with him. So if Coogan's like, put his, took him under his wing and probably saved well, him. Hopefully, from... hopefully listen to Coogan because Coog Coogan knows this game and he's done brilliantly, hasn't he? He's yeah, he done... saved him a good hiding yesterday, uh, Coogan. And, and I would have felt horrible if I had to crack him, honestly, and roll about on the floor with me. Would have, I would have felt awful, mate, honestly, because Max says, oh, you'd be down as a bully, wouldn't you? I said, probably. Yeah, oh, you, you, you wouldn't have done yourself any But he's a grown man in his 30s, carrying off like that. So, is it bullying? He's a grown man. He's got to protect responsibility for well, his it's, actions. It, it's bullying because it's, it's how people present what happens, isn't it? And people yeah. people wouldn't present it as something that you've been, re, you know, this, oh, Porky does all this stuff himself anyway, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, but you've got it, to understand, yeah, but Julian, you've got to understand, right? How he carried off in his eight, ten videos, the, the, the vile threats and this and that, and what he's carried off like, I'd be in the just desserts to go around there and give him a bop. Well, not really. Well, if, he's, if, if he has made awful comments about, yeah. about De Dean, then Dean Powell, then... Oh, that, yeah, 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 he has, yeah. Oh, he's definitely it just does doesn't, show good, it doesn't show good character, does it? It shows really poor character. Um, you've helped him out, and I know you know your your partner said the same thing that you were really good to him, and you really helped him out, and you gave him a bed, a warm bed to sleep in, and food in his belly. And he's turned around on you. It looks like he's now turning on Kel Brook. He's best mates with Eddie Hearn, but he's slagged Eddie Hearn off rotten over the years. Apparently, oh my out. channel! Oh my god! <laughs> so maybe these people are. I don't know. Maybe they give him a chance. I know. I think has Adam Smith done some stuff with him. I'm not sure, but um... they put their arm around him, aren't they? Because he's like he is, isn't he? But sometimes people take kindness as weakness, and when it comes on top, they play victim, don't they? Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? So oh, people... oh, oh, oh. I don't know what's happening. What's happening? I didn't know what was happening yesterday. 
But yeah, well, you know, thing, and... <laughs> yeah, the, the one thing Russell is you you can be people have we all of our issues, we all of our problems, and nothing's ever straightforward. And you know, no. people sometimes behave a certain way because of life events or other things. But it doesn't matter if you've had a, a good upbringing or if you've had a bad upbringing or all the chances in the world or not. You still do shit tricks. It's a shit trick. You do not bite the hand that, that people are trying to help you. You don't fucking do that. And I know from your partner what she said that you did a really good deed. Yeah. And it's basically just a long time ago, over two and a half years ago now, two years eight It's a shit. Ago. It's a shit trick to do. It's a shit trick. You know, slagging off. You know, Kel Brook, um, who's just that. Just had a little met move around with him and give him a give him an opportunity that most kids would love to just sort of share the ring with Kel Brook. And it's just shit treatment, mate, isn't it? Um, and he just needs to decide what he wants to be. Do you want to be a fighter? Do you want to be I keep saying, are you a fighter? Are you a broadcaster? Are you an Olympian? What is it you want to do? And you can't go too hard on him because he he definitely is delusional. I mean, if he's six foot two and a half, then they might as me, five eight. Yeah, I think. But good, good luck to you, Michael. Good luck to you, mate. Yeah, good luck to you. I, I, I wouldn't give after you've done your video this weekend. I, I personally, I'd yeah, I think it's in production now. So I'm gonna put that out and then we'll put yeah. it to bed. If he wants to carry on doing videos, so to me, I don't want to be one of them people. Like I look at these other channels and they're going back and forth. He said, she said. I said I didn't want to get involved in that. And he's done what is it? Ten videos. So I'm gonna have to reply to him. I'm not even gonna reply. I'm gonna go visit him. <laughs> I couldn't believe it when Max turned up at my house. Come on, we're going to Nottingham. But uh, but Max has been real training. How is he getting on, Max? Anyway, is he, is he Max is doing okay. I'm actually um, my, my partner. She's all right with this. We're going off for day tomorrow and night. We're off to Scarborough. Oh, fish and chips at Max's. I'm gonna, gonna call in and I'm gonna give Max a little workout. I gave him a workout on I forget was it yesterday morning. This sometime this week with a really early start. He came over. 6 a.m. set off and we went mad gym in Batley and I gave him an hour and a half beasting before I started work and give him a good 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 session and he's coming over sorry I'm going over there tomorrow and I says I'll tell you what Max I'm in Scarborough oh. put your gloves and I'll call in your gym and I'll give you give you an hour on pads or something like that he's doing yeah. all right mate the one thing look he's got a lot of he's very basic he's very inexperienced but what he doesn't do, if you ask him to do something, he's absolutely knackered. He'll really do it. He'll try his best. He won't. He's a trier, though, isn't he? Yeah, he's a trier. He's got some balls on him. And, you know, I think we did six, seven threes on pads the other morning. Hard pads, you know, hard hard routine. And he was blowing out of his ass. We kept going. He didn't quit. And Not quit, he turns, upon, he turns upon time. And he, he really does have heavy hands. Is, oh, he can, he can wax like a mill, man. He, yeah, he, uh, we, we, we just had a mess about. I did a bit of body sparring with him, and I very rarely do it. I was trying to show him some moves, and people say he's overweight. It's like it's like hitting a tree. He's a he's a strong lad. I mean, he's I'm like professional rugby league, isn't he? You know, if he hits you, you're going to go down. He's a strong lad, and he was just touching me on the arms and tickling me a little bit, and you, you could feel it. It's like yeah, all right, different weights, but. He's a solid. He's a solid jab. He's a he's a big, strong lad. Do you think, uh, Julian, that uh, Max could maybe pinch a belt in the UK? Do you think at some point down line, an area well, it, belt or something? It depends on the setup, doesn't it? Because the, the domestically, the top ten fighters would be way too hot for him. Probably at any stage because of the his age and lack of mm. experience. But anything below the top ten domestically. There's not a lot of art. There are a lot of white collar fighters out there. And with the right mm. approach, the right conditioning, three or four fights abroad to give him a bit of experience. But who knows? Listen, it, Brit, British title, very unlikely. It's very, very unlikely. But there are belts out there, aren't there? There are other belts out there. There's you know, the British Masters, the central area. There might only be three or four heavyweights in a, in a certain area that are prepared to fight for a title. Listen, we saw that with McFarlane, didn't we, and the other kid in Scotland. Yeah. Yeah. You only had yeah. you only had a couple of kids who were in the area in Scottish heavyweights prepared to fight for that title, so they do got you, an opportunity. So you think Max is on their level? I think he's about 
12 months and six easy fights away from that level because it's not a high level is it um yeah it just depends i just hope that these guys getting these fights abroad and the continually easy fights and it just gets the rounds in he needs to get the rounds in and he needs to be fit for a good six threes and he's way off that yet but listen you got to start somewhere no one's questioning his balls no one's questioning the fact that he'll get in there and have a go and at the moment is grafting is is what else can you say is, is grafting and and listen it doesn't have the best physique for a heavyweight boxer but how many really do right now that the best heavyweight in the world doesn't have a best a great physique does he listen if max can get uh, well he's turned the he's turned the fight down hasn't he we yeah. uh boxer. yeah it was a right decision because that's way too early for him you know give him three or four fights maybe a little bit more in estonia or whoever knows what's going on right now in, in europe but give him a few more fights abroad knock over jobs let me have another 30 sessions with him. And then as an unlicensed coach, and he might be, um, he might, look, do you know, sometimes it's like with, with boxers, it's a bit like when I did some work with Tommy Broadbent when he, when he came back. It's not always about winning titles. Sometimes yeah. it's just nice for fighters to have their night. And what I mean by their night is you get a guy like Max, okay, you get him to 3-0, and 4-0, and he might get a shot on the undercard of a big bill. And he'll get to be around all these people, all these famous boxers. And it might get televised at the bottom end of the bill, a Queen's Grip promotion or something like that. And something like that for Max would be his world title. Win, lose or draw. And that was the same with Tommy Broadbent when I, you know, he got some stick, but he fought Florent Marcoux, but it was a massive arena. It was, it was, you know, it was the, the kind of, was it the O2? Massive arena on a big bill. He, he, he got to mix with big people and big names and that. And Matt, if Max does that, that'll be Max's world title. Not every champ, not every fighter can be a champion. Yeah. Sometimes you live in the dream just by. I mean, when I got into coaching and we started going on the sky bills and stuff with the boxers, I used to pinch myself. I'd be like, I'm stood in a room now with like this hat on there, this Carl Frock there, and warming Tyro and warming Tyro nurse on the pads. He's just walked in and it's, it's a bit, you pinch yourself. It's like, yeah. so hopefully Max can get a fight where he gets a decent wedge of cash. He gets a chance to train his balls off and he gets on a bill where he's mixed, it's on TV, celebrities are there and that might be enough for him, you know. That might be Max's night. Twain that Fraser. might be Max's win or lose. Yeah. Win or lose, Max, if you're a winner, just getting in there, mate. It might take Fraser Clark three rounds and get 20 grand or something. 100%. And, and, and lives to tell the time. Exactly. And if Fraser Clark, if you, got, if you fought Fraser Clark, and Fraser Clark goes on to be a world champion, Max can sit there with his grandkids and say, you know that yeah. kid there? I, I boxed him. him. I yeah. fought him. Yeah. It's yeah. not all about the, it's not all about that kind of, been at the elite level because so very few fighters get to be. I started the show by saying the same thing, didn't I? About yeah. when people say he's just domestic level as a British champion. And domestic level's right up there, right up there. Mm. It's not all about that. It's about enjoying what you do, not getting hurt, and sometimes just being on the big shows and being around it and being part of it. And that's enough for a lot of fighters. Yeah, okie dokie. Uh, I'm just going to finish off on this. Uh, Dylan White Fury, does it happen next month? It's a, it's a strange one, is that? I've said definitely I said yes, then I said no, then I said yes. I'm still saying yes, purely because I don't want to be disappointed anymore, but, you know, like everybody else out there. We want to see the best everywhere in the world fight. We want to see Dylan White get his shot. You know, been however long he's been mandatory is irrelevant now. He's he's getting his shot. Yeah, he's earned his shot. He's getting his shot, and I want to see the fight. And what I don't want to see is a week before, two weeks before the fight, bullshit pullouts. Yeah, because if the, if there's a pullout by White coming up to this fight, it'll stink. Boxing it'll forever. Absolutely stink because people will say you have no intention. So. I think he's going to turn up and I think Dillian White's going to put on the performance of his life genuinely and he's going to, at some point, he's going to 
he's going to put a little bit of fear into Fury. He's going to have his moment. He'll get beat, but I think he'll, he'll be able to look at himself in the mirror and thought, I fought the best ever weight in the world and I gave it my all. And look, if he gives Fury a good fight, it doesn't put him out of the heavyweight picture, does it? What do you think if uh, Dylan White does get a freak injury with a week to go, that's not going to go down too well for him, is it? And if it was genuine, how would you explain that? Oh, you, you just never would, would you? It's just like, how can you? you? You just... It'd be just gutting for people because this is a big event at Wembley and there's a lot Massive, of people looking it? forward to it. It's huge, isn't it? Um, I don't know what the undercard is. It, hopefully it's half decent, but I just... Can boxing take any more kicks in the balls right now? I mean, it's just, it's constant, isn't it? It's just non-stop, mm. you know? I mean, the world's in a tough place right now, but we, we need boxing to be vibrant and exciting. I want to see these, I want to see some real fights. I, I keep saying this all the time. You didn't ask me the question, but I want to see any of those four lightweights fight each other. I don't care who they are. Any of those four I want to see fight each other. I want to see Spence. I want to see Crawford. Uh, I don't well want to see well to wait, you mean? Yeah, I want to see the world to wait. So I, I don't want to see Canelo against Bivol. I want to see Canelo against Bitterbev. I want to see those fights what are going to make boxing the absolute best sport in the world when it's on it when it's on its night. That's what I want to see, and I think that's what everybody else wants to see as well. I want to see Joshua Boatsu fight someone with a pulse who's from Britain. Yeah, yeah, I don't. Okie dokie then. Well, listen, thanks for coming on, Julian. We've had uh, a good hour and a uh, half. More. Nearly two hours. Always good, mate. What have you got planned for this evening? So this evening, I'm going to drop my daughter off at Drama, come back. I've got to go shopping, actually, mate, because I'm going away for tomorrow and tomorrow night. So do Scarborough, aren't you? Boring stuff, mate, and then I'm off to Scarborough tomorrow, and I'll, uh, I'll pop in and see Big Max. Off into see Max. Well, listen, give Max my best. It's his birthday Monday, so get him a sticker oh, rock. Okay. Get him a sticker rock. <laughs> uh, he'll be having more than a sticker rock with Max, won't he? All right, then, Julian. Well, listen, you take care and all the best. Thanks for coming on. Okay, Peace mate. Out. Thanks, Russell. Bye Cheers, bye. 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 Bye, bye, mate. Bye. Well, that were uh, Julian McGowan from Jewsbury. Lovely fella. He uh, always calls it, uh, as he sees it, a very honest man, man with integrity. Uh, I like him a lot. It's been a blessing in disguise. I think, it's, I think it's been great to have him on the channel. He's very popular. All the chaps like him, all the other big hitters on here, Kent and Terry Rico and uh, Cy Thompson, Dale, they haven't been on for a bit, but they like Julian. Uh, Burnsy. All them, Ryan, Ryan Riddell, and any others. I know it's very popular. Uh, that's about it, really. Uh, at the time I get this uploaded a little bit and leave here, it'll be eight o'clock. Eight o'clock about the time I leave here on a Friday night. Right? A week. Four weeks since that party. That's it. Ever again. <laughs> Uh, I used to normality in my life. Uh, Okie doke. So that's about it, really. Oh, I'm on for some soup tonight, I think. With some out of soup. Half a slice of bread. Third of a tin of soup with half a slice of bread. We could get a, a, a tin of cola there. That'll do me, I think. Uh, it's no wonder I've got an head like a skull, isn't it? Right then. All right, so have a great weekend. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Uh, I hope all you uh, folk your followers leave a nice comment and share it on your WhatsApp. And I hope all you uh, who are not Porky followers and uh, all those of you who uh, like to get brave behind the keyboard, leave some keyboard comments. Keep that interaction going. Uh, it's important you do that. Do as you're told. That's about it, really. Uh, all right, then. Uh, I can get to get to do the business now and get this all uploaded and that. This is a bit I hate, really. 
Oh God, it's uh, this is uh, I'm gonna do it myself. Save uh, save us getting an invoice for it. Marvelous one. Friday at this time of night. I'm normally being bozo, but no, well enough. One month, one week. I didn't get one shot of screwed up paper in my bin. <laughs> All right. Uh, don't forget to. Did I give a mention? Ash next door, they've got a same one, Eastwood Autos. Being cars away right here, left, right, and center. Uh, Spider Nice 18 plate BM out there. Or Core 8 round, wrapped around me, but you spent like nearly a couple of grand on your car getting it serviced and there. Uh, you know, all, all ready to be all right on road and all that. Why trade it in? You do that when you do that, don't you? Before you spend money on it, trade it in. So it's a shame, isn't it? Otherwise, I think I might have that BM off your ash. It's nice. The electric one, is it? 330E on an 18. Okie doke. Peace out.